All right, good evening. Welcome to the International Spy Museum. My name is Vince Houghton. I'm the historian and curator here at the museum. We'd like to uh, welcome all of you, give a special welcome to our co-sponsors, the Textile Museum. Uh, I think tonight's program shows that educational institutions, no matter what they are and how different they may be, can come together to put together a great program. Uh, so we're very happy to be working with them here tonight. So first I want to introduce Tom Gaynor, who is the Curator of Education for the George Washington Museum and the Textile Museum. Tom? Uh, good evening. And um, yes, I am the Curator of Education uh, from the Textile Museum and the George Washington Museum, uh, recently reopened uh, at our 21st Street location from our old home on S Street. And when Amanda, uh, who is also an alum of my program at GW, picked up the phone and said, we're doing a program on Jim Thompson, I just said I couldn't wait um, to find out the answer. Um, <laughs> on behalf of our museum, I want to thank our colleagues at the International Spy Museum for inviting Lee and myself and our membership uh, as we finally, hopefully, resolve this 50-year-old mystery on the disappearance of Jim Thompson, uh, the Silk King of Thailand. Our director, uh, John Wettenhall, regrets uh, he could not uh, attend and hope that you will pay, let's see, our new exhibition on ebony uh, fashion uh, uh, and our timely exhibition on campaign flags uh, from the turn of the century a visit at our other location. As a prelude to the discussion of Jim Thompson's mysterious disappearance, Lee Talbot, um, our curator of Eastern Hemisphere collections at the George Washington University and Textile Museum, will briefly comment on the history of silk, Thompson's pivotal role in revitalizing the Thai silk industry, and the ongoing legacy of his entrepreneurship, which is still around today, as many of you know. Before joining the Textile Museum staff, uh, Lee spent two and a half years as curator at the Chung Yung Yang Embroidery Museum in Suk Myung uh, Uni Women's University in Seoul, Korea. Um, his recent exhibitions include the recently completed as of January, uh, Bengada only in Okinawa, stories of migration, contemporary artists interpret diaspora, China through the lens of John Thompson, another Thompson, uh, dragons, nagas, and creatures of the deep. And among the many books, articles, and essays he has authored are chapters on China and Korea in history of design, decorative arts, and material culture, 1400 to 2000. Art by the Yard, Women Design, Mid-Century Britain, Sourcing the World, uh, John Eric Rees Re-Envisions Historic Tapestry, Thre uh, Threads of Heaven, Textiles in East Asian Ritual and Ceremony. Lee Talbot also serves on the board of directors of the Textile Society of America and the editorial board of the Textile Journal of Cloth and Culture. Please join me in uh, welcoming Lee Talbot to the stage. Okay, got the order right. All right, thank you very much, Tom. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. So silk is one of East Asia's greatest gifts to world civilization. For thousands of years, people around the world have sought the sensual pleasures of silk's uh, soft textures and alluring sheen. While Jim Thompson is often called the Silk King, silk is undoubtedly the king of fabrics because of its many remarkable properties. Um, secreted from the spinning glands of uh, the Bombyx mori moth, silk is the strongest natural fiber by weight. It's easy to dye in various colors, it's durable, and it's elastic. But it's very labor intensive to produce, so around the world, Silk has long been a very expensive luxury. Sericulture, which is the practice of cultivating silkworms, began more than 5,000 years ago in China. 
And with the onset of the Silk Road uh, at the end of the first millennium BC, silk became China's most coveted export. Chinese silk became so fashionable in ancient Rome that many writers and rulers disparaged the unfavorable balance of trade as Roman gold and silver flowed to the east in exchange for silk. China closely guarded the secret of sericulture for millennia and sentenced to death anyone caught smuggling silkworm eggs, cocoons, or even mulberry seeds. Um, nonetheless, the legend tells us that uh, around the year 440, a Chinese princess smuggled out silkworm eggs uh, by hiding them in her voluminous uh, head pay, uh, hair dressing um, and when she moved to Central Asia uh, to marry the prince of Khotan. And then around 550, two Nestorian uh, monks arrived at the court of Emperor Justinian in Constantinople with silkworm eggs hidden in their hollow canes, launching the silk industry in Byzantium and in Europe. The knowledge of silk production traveled with the ancestors of the Thai people as they migrated over the centuries from what is now China into peninsular Southeast Asia. Today, silk is so closely associated with Thailand that even the national airline um, has adopted the slogan, smooth as silk. While the history of silk in China, I mean in Thailand, is an ancient one, the modern global reputation of Thai silk dates to the post-World War II period, and it's largely attributable to the efforts of our subject tonight, Jim Thompson. Um, in the late 19th century, imports of relatively inexpensive industrial, industrially produced fabrics sounded the death knell uh, for much of Thailand's traditional silk weaving. Although King Rama V tried to revive this ailing craft uh, in 1902 through various initiatives, silk weaving continued to decline, particularly on the household level. And by the middle of the 20th century, even the Thai royal court was for the most part wearing imported Japanese silks and even rayons. Silk production continued, however, in the remote northeast of Thailand and also in Bangkok in a small neighborhood of Cham people, a Muslim group who relocated to Thailand in the 18th century. Jim Thompson befriended these Bangkok weavers and often traveled to the northeast to learn more about sericulture and silk weaving. He was captivated, captivated by the colors, the distinctive textures of Thai silk, which he called lumps and bumps, which really gives it this, um, uh, this distinctive texture. And he felt sure that there was a global market for this. Um, so with his, his sensitivity to local production and also his knowledge of Western markets, he succeeded in transforming a local craft into an international luxury brand. The jewel-like colors of Thai silk seemed to lift the veil off of wartime gloom, and they found an eager market in the West. Encouraged by Thompson's success, other Thai silk businesses were set up, and many of them prospered. As such, an ancient but dying handicraft became a robust industry and the pride of Thailand. Despite Thompson's contribution, his enemies were legion, and his very famous demise is our subject tonight. Nonetheless, Thai silk is renowned for its high quality and unique style throughout the world. The industry that Thompson revived now employs as many as 20,000 people, and 50 years after his mysterious disappearance, Jim Thompson still reigns as the Silk King. All right, thank you. Oh, we haven't even kicked off the program yet. I already know more about textiles than I've ever thought I would. So let me introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Llewellyn Lu Tolman. Grew up in Thailand while his father helped establish the Royal Thai Bureau of the Budget. Later in life, Lu worked on government reform projects in Thailand, visited the famous Jim Thompson House and Museum many times, and was always curious about the disappearance. That curiosity led to his extensive research and 687-page report on the case. Lou is a fellow of the Explorers Club, was on the board of directors of the Explorers Club Washington Group, and is a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society. He has led four Explorer Club flag expeditions, most re recently in the search for the female chefs of Vanuatu in the Southwest Pacific. 
you just wanted a vacation in the South Pacific is really what was going on there. He has later participated in searches for light planes, missing persons, lost towns, lost battlefields, and vanished plantations. Some of these searches have been inside the fence with law enforcement and search and rescue teams, and some outside the fence, working privately for families of the missing. He is the author of various professional academic articles in peer-reviewed journals. Lou holds a PhD in public administration economics and has worked on projects in management analysis and telecommunications policy for 20 U.S. federal agencies and 30 foreign governments on every continent. Every continent? Antarctica too? Uh, mostly every continent. Uh, as a principal at Booz Allen Hamilton and as an independent consultant. He was formerly the chair of the section on national security and emergency management for the American Society for Public Administration. Lou has traveled to 144 of the 196 countries on earth, and that if you count Taiwan, 196, 195, if you go otherwise, uh, and is contributing editor and monthly travel exploration columnist for the Montgomery Sentinel of Maryland. His website is themosttraveled.com, and his website includes his search for the real Bali High and his report on the Jim Thompson case. So if you want more after what you hear tonight, you go to the website. All downloadable for free under Lou's New Adventures. Please welcome Lou Tolman. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. This is a great turnout, uh, and it's an honor to be here. And thank you very much. I already learned something tonight about uh, Thai silk. By the way, in the background of many of the slides, you'll see some Thai silk, and you'll see how beautiful and iridescent it is. And I urge you, if you have never seen it, to go out and have a look, and you'll probably come home with about uh, 50 kilograms worth of it. So I think you've probably heard enough about me. Um, maybe the only other thing I should say is that uh, many of those federal agencies were on the civilian side, but some were on the defense side also, Defense Communications Agency uh, and uh, other outfits. So um, I'm uh, familiar with search and rescue, but also uh, with both sides of the U.S. government. Um, today, we will cover the following topics. The exotic life of Jim Thompson, uh, his disappearance and search, uh, theories about the disappearance, analysis of the search, the murder of Jim's sister, uh, and a current or recent case in the Cameron Highlands, which might shed a little light on the disappearance, and then my conclusions uh, and implications. So that's a sort of roadmap, but uh, in terms of what we're really talking about, I mean, this case is really unbelievable. It's got everything you can imagine. It's got uh, movie stars, Thai silk, as you've heard, uh, snakes, tigers. It's got CIA, FBI, uh, just about every acronym you can imagine, all, all running around uh, trying to find Jim and um, doing interesting things before he disappeared. So it's really quite one of the most amazing cases I've, I think I've ever looked into. I mean, you really couldn't make up this stuff, so I hope you'll enjoy it. So let's talk about his exotic life. He was born in 1906. Uh, he was an architect and designer. He spoke fluent French. Uh, he was gracious, cultured, had piercing blue eyes. He was a great businessman, but he was perhaps a little too trusting of his subordinates, and sometimes they stole from him, sometimes quite substantial amounts, which might bear on the case. Uh, he was definitely an OSS intelligence officer during the war, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. And after the war, he probably uh, would be described as a CIA asset, and I have some uh, proof of that. Um, and one might even call him an agent of influence, based on the documents that I was able to get at the National Archives, uh, too. Uh, he was an art expert and uh, art collector, and he had no children, and he had many affairs, most of them with women. And we'll find out about the FBI's views on that in a few minutes. Uh, he started off, he enlisted as an army private, uh, actually uh, before the war started, and in just six years rose to lieutenant colonel in the OSS, which I think is a testimony to his uh, drive, expertise, and brilliance. Uh, he was really a polymath, just a terrific, uh, amazing person. He won uh, five bronze stars for his exploits. Unfortunately, the details of those have never come to light, but it is clear that he served uh, behind the lines in France and parachuted uh, into France, into occupied France, um, and then did similar work, either parachuting or sneaking into the Balkans from a base in, in Italy. Uh, he was about to be parachuted into Thailand uh, near the end of the war and was actually on the plane um, with uh, uh, his team 
and they were flying towards Thailand and then got the word uh, that it looked like the war was going to end. Uh, the bomb had been dropped and it, it might be over, so come on back, and uh, then he could um, just fly into Thailand and land like a normal person, which he did. He then served for a year uh, as what we would call today the chief of station, um, CIA's term. They used a different term at the time, uh, but uh, that was clearly what he was. And since there wasn't an ambassador there from the United States during most of that time, uh, he was really the, uh, one of the most important people uh, from our country uh, in Thailand at the time. So he met everybody in the region. And he was very sympathetic to the um, uh, rebels in the region. Remember, our policy at the time was sort of anti-French, anti-colonial. So he got to know uh, all of the resistance groups in the area. Uh, have a look at the uh, memos at the bottom there. And you'll see he resigned after a year in office. Um, and on the left is a very ordinary resignation letter. It, this, these are OSS uh, memos, and you notice that it never says OSS, because OSS was oh so secret that they didn't even put their name uh, on their letterhead, which I think is kind of funny. Uh, United States government is all it says. So here he's resigning, and you see his nice strong signature. But uh, over on the other side is a much more interesting and unusual memo. And the bottom sentence is still redacted by the CIA when I requested this uh, and got this copy uh, after 70 years. So redacted, of course, means that they, uh, they blanked it out. So they know what it says, but we don't know what it says, and I don't know what it says. It does say, the paragraph above, above says, uh, Mr. Jim Thompson, formerly General Attaché, uh, Chief of Station at Bangkok, has returned from his post, uh, arriving in Washington, and will not return to Siam in government service. Interesting. So what does that next sentence say? Well, I submit that from the context, it might say that he will be returning to Thailand, but under illegal cover, or meaning that he was um, uh, an agent uh, and would be an asset to the CIA, but uh, it would not be official. But we'll never know until this is released. It is pretty unusual that after 70 years, this, uh, this sentence is still not being released. And in fact, I could get nothing out of the um, CIA passed this memo. So this is in um, 1947. Um, that's pretty amazing. So as we've heard, uh, Jim built up the Thai silk industry. Um, before that, by the way, he, his eye first went to the, uh, the Oriental Hotel. Has anybody been to the Oriental Hotel? Right? Fabulous hotel. Uh, and he was part owner for a short while of the Oriental Hotel. But he had a little dispute with the owners and he decided to bail out because he was convinced that it was so run down that it would never be a success. So he was not always a great businessman because that's now one of the great hotels of the world. Uh, but luckily he did bail out and instead he went uh, and created the Thai silk industry. And as you've heard, uh, not only created his own company but then uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, competitors uh, sprang up uh, and that may have some bearing on his disappearance. And uh, so it's now a mainstay of the Thai economy. How many here have been to his fabulous house museum? All right. <laughs> I think that may be one of the main reasons that many of you came. It's just so fascinating and uh, such a terrific place. It, it is a, an amazing testimony to him and to his many talents. Uh, and if you haven't been there, I, I urge you to go there. As you may know, he assembled six different... Um, antique houses from other parts of Thailand, brought them together, and with his designer and architectural skills, assembled them into one beautiful uh, complex. And it's really uh, fantastic. And he stuffed it, of course, with Asian art, starting with a lot of Thai art, but then there was some problems with that, as you'll hear about. And so uh, he ended up with not quite as much Thai art, especially not uh, Thai Buddha heads. One of the reasons he's so famous, and probably one of the reasons he was an asset to the CIA, was that he entertained almost every night. Sometimes just two or three people, but often 200, 300 people. I mean, it was amazing. And anybody who was anybody in the 50s and 60s who went on an Asian tour would almost certainly stop in Thailand, and they would almost certainly be invited, if they were somebody, uh, to go to his house. So here are some of the people uh, that he 
introduced to each other if they didn't know each other, uh, that attended his parties, and these, this is just a small sample of the thousands of uh, people. So I'm sure you can identify most of these folks, um, so I won't go through them all, uh, but you can see we've got uh, time uh, covers here. These are Fords in the, in the bottom uh, middle, um, Truman Capote, Somerset Maughan uh, was there. Uh, he probably had something to chat with uh, Jim about because he was ex-MI5, the British Security Service. And Jim had clients all over the world. Uh, I mentioned movie stars. We've got movie stars. Uh, so this is Liz Taylor and Grace Kelly. They were clients of his. And he got his start by uh, recommending, uh, uh, by penetrating the, uh, the play The King and I, which was just opening on Broadway and which, of course, was a very logical place uh, for them to use and, and uh, display Thai silk. And that was a great success, and that really uh, pushed him on his way. Queen Siriket of Thailand is shown in the uh, middle top there um, with Jim uh, examining his silks, and she was a client. Uh, and most people don't know that the original Ben-Hur, the one from, uh, what, 30, 40 years ago, uh, used Thai silks. And maybe that's one of the reasons that that was a very successful Ben-Hur, and this recent one was eh, so, so. <laughs> Another less famous um, client of Jim was uh, my mother, and that's shown uh, in this invoice here. And here we have Jim with his signature um, saying to, uh, sending a letter to my mother and saying that uh, a, uh, per her order, so an order is being sent to a friend in Mobile, Alabama. And we were living in Thailand at the time. And I actually, my wife found this memo uh, in a filing cabinet uh, on the day that I finished my massive report on uh, Jim's disappearance. So that was a little spooky. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't say on the back uh, how he disappeared. And, um, and I don't want you to expect that, <laughs> as was sort of implied, that you will get the answer uh, today. But we'll, we'll give it a try. So let's talk about his disappearance. Uh, this fabulous guy just vanished. How did that happen? Well, he went for Easter vacation to Tanarata, Malaysia, which is a little vacation uh, town um, in north-central Malaysia. It's about 90 miles south of the Thai border. Uh, you see the Garmin there. That's a picture of my Garmin showing some of the 214 curves on the road up there. Uh, the whole place is just full of these conical hills and uh, very confusing to a hiker and uh, very difficult. Um, it, the elevation up there is five to 6,000 feet, and it's quite cool, and that's why it's a wonderful resort. Uh, on the right, upper right, you see a view of the town in the 1960s. It was only had about 200 yards, one street, uh, commercial area. It was the kind of place that anybody who was new would always be noticed, and everybody knew everybody. It was very, very small, so uh, I think that has a bearing on the case. If you go there now, you'll see some of the classic Cameron Highlands Land Rovers that have a CH on the side because they're, they're so beat up, they're not allowed to go anywhere else. Uh, but they're really wonderful uh, old vehicles. And it's still got some beautiful views, although some bits are a little bit tacky now. But I'd still recommend it, especially if you want to investigate the mystery. So on the day of the disappearance, uh, Jim awoke. Uh, he went to church with his friends that he was staying with. And he was staying at the Moonlight Bungalow, uh, this place that you see here, which belonged to two of his uh, good friends. And he'd been there twice before, uh, but just for short periods, uh, two or three days each time. And in the lower right, you see the last known picture of Jim Thompson, which was taken at this picnic uh, on Easter Sunday, March 26th. So almost exactly 50 years ago. And this was just a few hours before he disappeared. By the way, you can go to uh, this house the Moonlight Bungalow, and you can stay there. It costs about $130 a night, and I stayed there. Uh, unfortunately, uh, no ghost whispered in my ear the answer to the mystery, uh, which was unfortunate. So that afternoon, he uh, took a short walk. He told his hosts that he was going to go for a short walk. Uh, they heard crunching of gravel uh, outside their window, which they took to meant that he was walking away, which to me probably means that he was walking back behind the house uh, and down what no other author had ever found, but I found it called something called the Kitchen Trail, which went steeply downhill behind the house. Uh, there isn't one access road. 
Uh, but I would think that it means that he didn't go down that road. So he said he was going to go for a walk, and this was his habit. Uh, he loved to hike, and he loved to hike cross-country, which is not a good idea. Uh, if you look to the, um, at these pictures, uh, you'll see views from the house, and uh, what happened was he, he went uh, for this hike, and he just vanished. There was absolutely no trace afterwards. There were a few people who said that they uh, had seen him or maybe had seen him, and I'll talk about uh, those folks, but unfortunately none of them are really of high uh, quality. So if you look to the uh, northwest on the far side there, you can see how thick the jungle is. And that jungle goes all the way to the Thai border, about 90 miles. And if you look to the uh, south, you can see this green tongue of land. And then in the distance, there's sort of a green patch. That's the golf course um, in the middle of town. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And then off to the west, you can see that now there's some, uh, these photos uh, in the middle I, all, I took, and you can see that uh, there's some development now, but at the time, there was no development. So that also was very jungly. It's not clear what direction he went in. So he, he vanished, and um, of course his friends didn't notice anything for a few hours, but then as uh, you know, the uh, day went on, uh, they got alarmed, and they started uh, looking. They organized what's called a hasty search, which is a good thing to do. Um, and they went up and down the uh, local roads looking for him. They couldn't find him. They were calling out, Jim, Jim, where are you? Um, couldn't find him. They did mobilize the local police, and the police and his friends started, uh, kept looking for him that night until about uh, 2 a.m., to their credit, which is a uh, you know, tricky thing to do uh, in, uh, in an environment like that. The next day, they got more people involved since he was very famous. And by the next day after that, the search was huge and involved hundreds and hundreds of people. And the, the uh, Malaysian army and police force uh, was brought in, a special force of uh, sort of field operatives uh, uh, from the Malaysian army were brought in. Uh, and they searched. And they searched for 11 days, which is a very, very long time in search and rescue. Most search and rescue operations uh, end after about a day. Uh, so they really, to their credit, they did a lot. Uh, and they worked hard at it. But uh, they didn't find a single trace, not a clue, nothing. So what are some theories about the uh, disappearance? Well, they uh, remember they looked very, very hard. This was probably the biggest search in Southeast Asian history uh, on land. Uh, and they felt that they had done a very credible job. And here you see a couple of, a couple of reports. I'll let you... Uh, Look at them if you can see. I don't know if you can see in the back. I'll read you the key bits. So on the left here, we see a report that was made uh, to J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI uh, at the time. And it summarizes the case and basically says uh, that Jim Thompson uh, went with some friends and uh, was visiting them at a, a bungalow in the Cameron Highlands. Um, the redacted bits there are the names of the people involved, and it's quite easy if you know the case to figure out who is being talked about. So it's not, there's nothing super secret in there, I'm pretty convinced. Um, and it basically summarizes the case and says that they kept searching and, in fact, uh, continued to search until 2 a.m., as I mentioned. Um, and uh, then the search went on and we're not able to find anything. So that's a fairly standard um, uh, memo. This was written about five weeks after the uh, disappearance, and to my knowledge, this is this and all of the things that I show you here are being shown to the public for the first time. They've been referenced in a few other uh, books or footnoted, but uh, they're all available in my report uh, in the annexes, and that's why it's so massive. <laughs> so you can examine the evidence for yourself. So uh, the other memo is a bit more interesting. It's also written about five weeks after, and it's a uh, Department of State uh, memo. It's written. Uh, to the uh, Honorable William F. Bug Bundy, who is a famous Assistant Secretary of State. And it says, the, f the first thing to be said is that as seen from Bangkok, there is virtually no prospect of a solution to the case. After several weeks of organized search in the jungle by the Malaysian police, and after Mr. Noon's careful expedition, so this was an expert who was brought in, although he only spent about 72 hours there, so I wasn't so impressed with that. Uh, there seemed to be every reason to accept Noon's judgment 
that Jim was not lost in the jungle. So that became the view of uh, the Thai authorities, the American authorities, the Malaysians, who uh, pretty clearly very early on uh, decided that he was not in the jungle. And they searched hard in the jungle, but, but they decided that there was some other explanation. So he's not in the jungle. And basically the view is, we have searched the jungle, he is not there. He must be somewhere else. Well, obviously that raises some big questions, doesn't it? Uh, how did that happen, if, that's, if that is the case? So, of course, there are myriad possible suspects. I mean, it might be a self-disappearance, uh, it might be a kidnapping, and so on. Uh, might be a murder, uh, who knows? Well, there are so many theories that it's sort of like uh, grains of sand on a beach, and I'll only hit a few uh, highlights. But one theory is that the CIA got rid of him. Well, why would they get rid of somebody who had at least been an asset of theirs at least through the mid-60s. It seems pretty clear that by the time he disappeared, he was not really involved uh, with the agency and um, you know, a different crew was uh, sailing that ship. Um, but he had been uh, definitely an asset as late as 1950, where I was able to find a document, a Department of State document that said that he was running supplies to the Viet Minh uh, and to other anti-French uh, resistance groups um, so that's not something that an ordinary U.S. citizen does, right, uh, especially not a, on his own. Uh, so he, he definitely had a history, but I think uh, it probably petered out and he focused more on his, on his own um, uh, business in the middle 60s. There is also the theory that, this, and that's why I put CIA up here, that he opposed the war in Vietnam. Remember, Vietnam was really uh, hot in 65. Uh, and through 67, and some theorists say, well, he opposed the war. And there's one book that's actually for sale in the back that uh, pushes this a little bit. But uh, the sources I talked to said, well, uh, in fact, William Warren, the other book uh, that's back there, uh, on one of his pages, it says that, no, he, he wasn't really that opposed to the war, and he even rebuked someone who was uh, opposed to the war once. So... Um, you know, possible, but seems to me unlikely. Uh, one person that's mentioned is a very unusual suspect, UN Ambassador Charles Yost, who uh, became the ambassador uh, to the United Nations and had previously been an ambassador in Laos and, and elsewhere. Uh, he had a beautiful Polish wife, Irina Yost, and she's been uh, named as one of um, Jim Thompson's lovers over time. Uh, so Charles was no dummy, and this apparently went on for years. He must have known about it, so he might be a suspect if you were investigating this today. Seems very, very unlikely, but uh, if I was a police officer today, I would look into that. Communist terrorists are an obvious possibility, and in fact, this headline was just from two weeks before the disappearance, uh, where it says, uh, Red killed in border uh, battle with Thai police. So this was about 90 miles away up on the Thai border. Uh, there had been a clash with communist terrorists. But it uh, seems unlikely that they would kidnap him and then not uh, do anything with him, not produce a ransom note or something like that. And there was no ransom note. There was no nothing uh, along those lines. Uh, he had an ex-lover and art associate, Lisa Lyons. Uh, she took over his house for a number of months after he disappeared and was sort of house-sitting there. And so maybe she wanted access to his art collection or something. Uh, seems unlikely, and they had a very good friendship, and they, hundreds of her uh, letters back and forth with him are up at the University of Pennsylvania, and those, have, those were never before published, but they're also in my report. More possible suspects. Well, uh, one possible, again, very unlikely, but possible uh, suspect is the director of the Fine Arts Department in the Thai government. And doesn't that seem unlikely? Uh, but Jim was having a huge dispute with that department. He had bought on the open market five large uh, Buddha heads, each about this big, each quite valuable and beautiful. Uh, so beautiful, in fact, the middle one there, that it was recently lent by the National Museum of Thailand uh, to the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, up in New York. They, they wanted that for an exhibition. So that's the quality we're talking about. This is about 1,000 years old. And that one probably came from this cave here. And I was up in this cave um, uh, a few months ago, 
uh, was able to geolocate it for the first time. It had never been the exact lat long, had never been um, uh, published before. So I was able to, it's on top of a little steep mountain, which is so it's kind of hard to get up there. But each of these heads was cut off, sadly, uh, from the, um, the top there. And you can see there are a number of other places. Now, Jim had bought these five heads on the open market. He, um, he was approached by the Thai Fine Arts Department who said, you're looting the patrimony of our country. And he said, no, no, I'm going to be leaving all of this in my will, here's my will, to the Siam Society, which is this wonderful society under royal patronage uh, there, and thus to the Thai people. And the Thai Fine Arts Department director didn't like that answer, and he sent in the police, according to press reports, and press to seize these uh, heads. So uh, clearly, they really didn't like each other, and they had a feud that was going on. Now, whether that would have escalated to uh, murder, disappearance, uh, conspiracy, something like that seems unlikely, but uh, possible. On the lower right part of the slide, you see another possibility that's been raised a few times, is that perhaps uh, Jim knew something about the uh, sad death of King Ananda, uh, which happened while Jim was chief of station uh, in, uh, in Thailand. This is the predecessor to the current uh, late lamented king who just died recently, a wonderful uh, king. Um, and it, uh, this is, of course, a very sensitive matter, but uh, the previous king did uh, die of a bullet wound to the head um, in a, what may have been an accident. Uh, three courtiers of, uh, were accused and eventually executed, uh, but some folks think there may be more to it. Not, not clear. So perhaps Jim knew something about what really happened, because there's still speculation of what really happened. I certainly don't know what really happened, but uh, that is one item that's brought up. And there are numerous other uh, conspiracies that are referenced. Uh, here's another interesting one. Uh, one obvious thing is that Malaysian gangs, just uh, kidnapping gangs, might have kidnapped him. Well, um, we can put that one to rest because the FBI looked into that, and they say here in one of the most unusual memos I've ever read in 30 or years of government service, um, police contacted all criminal and communist gangs in Malaysia and received assurance that none of these groups had any knowledge pertinent to the victim's disappearance. So we can put that one to rest, right? God, that's amazing. Uh, another possibility, as I mentioned near the beginning, was that perhaps he had a homosexual lover. Um, as you see at the bottom, uh, it says that the, someone has received reports, probably the Thai police have received reports uh, from two sources, uh, one in Malaysia and um, uh, one in Bangkok, one uh, apparently reliable, that the victim is homosexual, so that Jim is homosexual. Well. So they're pursuing the sort of homosexual spat uh, type theory. You remember at this point, uh, the FBI was absolutely mad keen to know everybody's sexual orientation. Um, and especially J. Edgar Hoover seemed to be interested in that. Um, so uh, if he was homosexual, he was clearly bisexual because he, did, he was married uh, for a short time. Um, he got divorced, uh, but uh, he had... Uh, female lovers, uh, and I've got, you know, there's evidence of that in the letters. So, uh, I don't know. They're, they produce no other evidence other than this statement, so I'm not sure about that one. It seems very unlikely. Uh, upper right, there's a strange bank called the Nugan Hand Bank. Has anybody heard of that one? No? Okay. Um, well, this is an Australian bank, which supposedly had links to the CIA and was laundering money and there were drugs involved. You remember there were rumors back in the 60s and 70s that the CIA was taking money, uh, taking drugs out of Laos and selling it on the open market and then using that to fund their operations or something. I don't know. Um, this bank was apparently involved in that. Uh, this bank really was active more in the 70s uh, and so it seems unlikely to me that it would have been involved uh, in this. But the bank did end sort of badly. Uh, I think two of its main partners, one maybe committed suicide, one seemed to have been murdered, uh, kind of nasty stuff. Another possibility is business rivals in Bangkok. He did create um, this wonderful company, but other companies sprang up, 
And um, some of these uh, were headed by very powerful people. Uh, and there is a theory pushed by uh, one of the authors on sale here that uh, sort of hinted at that perhaps uh, one of them uh, did away with him and, and had him kidnapped. Possible, but think about all the steps you'd have to go through to uh, go after Jim in Tanarata, one of the most isolated places in Malaysia. There, I, in my report, I go through about 20 steps that an assassin would have to find out where he was going, figure out how to surveil this, uh, this little uh, uh, bungalow on top of a conical hill, which has nothing around it, overlooking it, figure out exactly when he was going to leave, when he didn't know himself, seize him, uh, get him away. I mean, there's just a lot of stuff. And when, if you want to do away with him, why not just have somebody in Bangkok run him over? I mean, the traffic there is famous, right? So nobody would, ha nobody would suspect. So I don't know. Uh, that seems unlikely to me. Now, of course, in any investigation, you always want to look at who benefits. Well, the main beneficiary was uh, the nephew, Henry B. Thompson. Uh, and he's not really a viable suspect. He was in New York at the time. He really had a uh, few or no connections with Thailand. Uh, he was a very wealthy stockbroker, and he heard about the disappearance on the ticker tape. Uh, and then as soon as uh, it became clear that he was going to inherit, he, he, within a year, he went over to Thailand and helped set up the, uh, the Thompson Foundation to honor Jim and to run the House Museum that many of you have enjoyed. Uh, so he's really a terrific guy, and he didn't seem like the kind of guy who was looting uh, the estate for his own benefit. And, of course, there's the, uh, you always look at the spouse. Uh, he, his ex-wife, Pat Thraves, was a, a former uh, model, and she's not really a suspect because, sadly, she was in Hawaii at the time. She was very sick, uh, virtually in a coma, and died shortly after. So... All of these theories are uh, swirling around, and there are headlines all around the world about this case uh, for uh, a month or two uh, after, including in the New York Times and, of course, back in Philadelphia and Delaware, where uh, Jim was from, and obviously in uh, Thailand and Malaysia. So it, it got worldwide attention. It was, it was big. Gradually, the attention uh, fell down, and then um, just a couple months later, a fellow named Ed Pollitz, perhaps saw Jim Thompson in Tahiti uh, on the 27th of May. And Ed is uh, moderately credible. He had known Jim. He had an appointment with Jim uh, just a couple of uh, days after the disappearance. He was supposed to meet him in Singapore. Uh, seems to be a reliable person. He was a volunteer, uh, retired uh, uh, American volunteer helping companies. Um, this on the right is the report. You're welcome to read it in my, in my report. Uh, again, that's the first time it's ever been published. Uh, and it basically says that uh, this fellow, uh, Ed Pollitz, was walking across the uh, hotel lobby of the uh, Hotel Tahiti, and he saw someone that he was convinced was Jim. Jim was walking away from him, and he had a woman with him. And Pollitz was convinced enough, uh, this is about 30 or 40 feet away, that he hollered out. Uh, Jim, Jim. But the man kept walking, got in a cab with the uh, woman, and took off. Ed was convinced enough that he actually did some investigative work on his own, tried to find out if there was any paperwork or anything to show that uh, Jim was around, couldn't find anything. Uh, to their credit, the Malaysian authorities sent uh, their top investigator down, and he looked around. He couldn't find any evidence. And then the family um, went down to Tahiti, and they couldn't find anything. So... Uh, when confronted about all this, uh, Mr. Pollitt said, I was convinced I could be wrong. I, you know, it might, it might have been somebody else, but I was pretty sure. So you now know what I know about that one. Completely different theory. This uh, interesting fellow, uh, Captain Philip Rivers, lives in the Cameron Highlands. Uh, these are all pictures of him. He was a Singapore police officer, so that gives him some credibility. He was also a merchant marine captain, a uh, very distinguished career, nice guy. He was kind enough to give me about four hours of his time uh, and a copy of his report, which is shown in the lower right. He wrote a 10-page report on the case, uh, which you're welcome to read. His theory is that uh, Jim was hit by a speeding truck. So he was on his walk. He's walking down the road, and then a speeding truck comes along, hits him, runs him over. 
uh, the driver jumps out and says, oh my God, you know, I've killed this, this guy, I've killed a foreigner. Oh geez, I'm in trouble. Um, realizes he's dead, throws him in the back of the truck, drives about uh, seven miles to the north, buries the body, uh, and then keeps quiet, tells no one. Uh, until the bones are found in the uh, 80s or 90s and come to light and end up in the district medical office uh, in Tanarata. So, you know, that sounds pretty good because that would explain why there's no body to be found nearby. Uh, everything was kind of quiet and so on. Unfortunately, um, the captain did not track down that district medical officer and did not track down the bones. But I did, and I was able to find the district medical officer. I was not able to see the bones because he told me, he's a very respected uh, medical officer, and he said, look, I had those bones. They were in my office. They were in a little box. I'm not even sure they were human bones. So that seems fairly important. Um, and the... Um, and there's no clear connection between those bones and Jim Thompson. They're, they were found, they were given to me, but uh, I've never seen any convincing evidence to link that to the case. And of course, there's lots of bones, lots of people dying uh, in that area. Uh, so I would rate this as, uh, like many of these, as possible, but uh, pretty unlikely, you know, probably in the 1% chance. There have been four books uh, that have described Jim's life and the case and causes. Uh, two of them are uh, for sale uh, out there. Uh, but interestingly, none of them have actually dealt with the search and rescue aspect. Um, and most of them have just about a page or even just a paragraph or two about the search itself. So when I started looking into this, I was kind of amazed at that. I mean, it seemed like a pretty obvious thing to try to evaluate the search, but nobody had ever tried to do that before. So uh, I said, well, I know something about search and rescue, and I've been involved in a number of searches, so I'm going to um, check this out. So that's how I uh, got involved, and that raises a lot of research questions. Some of them are, what obstacles did the search encounter? What was the quality and quantity of the search? What's the probability of success? That's a technical term in search and rescue. Uh, what are the causes and witnesses that can be eliminated, and what was Jim like as a search subject? So I was very fortunate. Uh, I wouldn't be standing here except that I was very fortunate to find uh, in Malaysia a number of the people who'd been involved in the 1967 case. And my uh, top respondent was shown in the upper right, uh, Captain Mukta Mohammed of the Malaysian Army, who had been a lieutenant, or lieutenant, he would say, uh, back in the Malaysian Army um, in 1967 and was one of the search leaders. So he was very informative and he told me about their tactics and their strategy and so on. Uh, you see some of these other folks uh, in the middle here. Um, Lieutenant uh, Dennis Horgan, US Army, he was sent up as an observer and sort of search participant. Uh, and he was very kind and answered all of my questions uh, very completely. Uh, in the lower right, you see some Malaysian police staff. And of course, I naturally went to them uh, first when I went up there and I said, you know, I want to talk to the, uh, the key person who knows about this case, and I want to see your case file and your annotated maps and, and all this stuff. And the uh, police said, who's Jim Thompson? And they said that they throw out all the uh, case files and all the information after 15 years on all the numerous missing person cases that they get in the Cameron Highlands, which just... Uh, you know, give me the shivers. I just hate the ideas of destroying records because I like evidence and records and maps and, and, and uh, witnesses you can cross-examine. So I was a bit quite disappointed at that. So what are some of the obstacles that they ran into? Well, the main obstacle is the terrain itself. I mentioned before that there was this, uh, uh, these conical hills, and you can see the contour lines on this map uh, and how difficult that terrain is. Uh, the Moonlight Bungalow there is at 5,100 uh, feet, and you can see that uh, there is, you see the line up above, that is sort of a continental divide between this province and the next province. And if Jim went over that continental divide, he could have, if he'd done what a lot of people are told to do and what apparently he was trained to do, which is to go downhill and get into a water course and go downhill and you'll find civilization, that would have been disastrous because that just keeps going for 90 miles, and he probably couldn't have made it 90 miles to the Thai border or to the coast. 
Um, so that's, that's a possibility. Uh, the other problem, of course, is the jungle itself. Now, the jungle, as you see there, this is one of my guides, and that's a trail. So these are not like trails at Yosemite or something like that. That's more of a little goat trail. That's what's now called the Jim Thompson Mystery Trail, and you're welcome to go up there. That's just below the Moonlight Bungalow, which is up and to the right. Um, and you see the jungle is a single canopy jungle. That's a problem because triple canopy jungle is good for searching. Triple canopy jungle is what you get in, uh, say, um, Brazil. And you've got literally three layers of vegetation. And that opens up the landscape at the bottom because there's no light that gets down there. So you can have space out your searchers every 20 or 30 yards in a triple canopy. But with a single canopy jungle, you get all this undergrowth that, that grows up. And so it's very, very difficult to search. And you have to, if you're going to do a line search, you have to have people maybe three feet to three meters apart. Uh, so very labor intensive. Uh, there are numerous ravines, uh, streams, drainages, um, one of which Jim actually got lost in the day before. So this is kind of unusual. So remember, he disappeared on a Sunday. And on the Saturday, he and Dr. Ling, one of his hosts, went hiking cross-country from the Moonlight Bungalow, which is shown here. And they wanted to go to the golf course. Remember I showed you the golf course earlier uh, in the middle of town. It's only half a mile away, and it's visible from the bungalow. And they headed out, figuring it would take them about a half an hour or 35 minutes. Four hours later, they stumbled onto the um, uh, golf club uh, golf course, and Dr. Ling had pulled a muscle and was quite upset. Uh, and uh, Jim, his reaction was he was exhilarated. He liked it. He liked being lost. He, he thought that was really cool. And I've never heard of any other search subject ever who liked being lost. Uh, so I think that's maybe telling. Uh, I was able, when I was there, to geolocate all of the uh, major search locations um, where eyewitnesses said uh, after he disappeared that they, um, uh, that they had seen him. And I won't go into uh, all the details here. Uh, but I was able to get exact lat longs for all of this. Uh, and that was very valuable because that allowed me to uh, evaluate these witnesses. There were about eight or nine people after the uh, disappearance who said they'd seen him, and I was able to impeach at least two of those as being too far away to really have uh, seen, you know, identified him or even have been sure that it was a foreigner. One was 200 yards away and one was 254 yards away. Here you see Captain Muhammad down at one of these locations pointing 200 yards up to the Moonlight Bungalow, which you see you can hardly see the Moonlight Bungalow, much less a uh, uh, Jim Thompson up there. Now, there were some people that were closer, like the cook on the far right. Uh, she said that um, she had seen him the day he vanished, that he was only six or seven yards away. Um, sounds good. Unfortunately, the Singapore policeman I told you about, Captain Rivers, says, well, I know that lady, and she's really not reliable. She sort of makes up things and stuff. So, uh, so eventually, I rated all of these folks, unfortunately, as low credibility. Another question you want to know is, how big was the search? Was it big enough to do the right job? It, we know it lasted 11 days, uh, and that's very obvious. But nobody knows uh, until now really how big it was. Uh, I got an estimate from Lieutenant uh, Horgan that it was in the high hundreds of person days. Uh, I went through all the press accounts and everything I could find and did a day-by-day -day analysis of how many person days I thought were delivered in the search, and I came up with 1,448, which is considerably, you know, 50% more than Horgan, so I think is pretty generous. Again, I won't go uh, through all of this, but I will note that uh, there was a very large reward offered, and no, there were, uh, nobody ever took uh, took up the reward, $25,000, which was a huge sum at the time. Um, there were, I should mention the bloodhounds. Now, that doesn't look like our normal kind of bloodhound, but Captain Muhammad told me that that is exactly the kind of dog that they used in the search. Now, dogs are dogs. You know, they don't absolutely have to look like bloodhounds, and they, they did use three of those, and they found Jim's scent in the area right around the uh, Moonlight Bungalow but they were not able to trace his scent down 
the access road or down the kitchen trail or anywhere else or cross country. So to them, and they did this on the second or third day, so to them that said, uh, he must, the scent trail must have been broken somehow and the only way to do that would be if he got in a car. So a car comes up, uh, picks him up, takes him off, and then he vanishes, you know, and he's off somewhere else. Uh, could be, but remember this is a very quiet area. This is 1967. Cars made a lot of noise back then. I have a 1968 Mustang, and uh, believe me, you can hear that from a mile away. So if such a car had come up the steep access road um, and made a lot of noise uh, and slammed the door and so on, the servants probably would have heard, and probably Mr. and Mrs. Ling, Dr. and Mrs. Ling would have uh, reported that. They didn't report anything like that. So that's, uh, that adds to the mystery, um, what happened and why... Uh, I did interview a number of dog handlers, and they say that you really have to be careful in managing these dogs. You have to handle the scent article very carefully. Uh, you can screw up easily, and even the dogs can mess up. So um, I'm not saying that that uh, evidence is conclusive. So how big an area needed to be searched? Well, Captain Muhammad said that they focused on the area three miles out from the um, uh, from the Moonlight Bungalow, mainly in the uh, north and east uh, and west uh, direction. They didn't focus on the lower right quadrant because that's the town. Um, and he said that they did three miles out, which is this, that area here in the yellow, uh, with the bright yellow line. And if you uh, assume that, that's, that they did that and that's right, then uh, through easy math, you can figure out that's about 17.7 uh, square miles needed to be searched. That's a lot. I mean, if you, any of you have ever lost your car keys in your house, you know how hard that is to find. Imagine trying to search 17 square miles. Um, and if you think that maybe they should have searched beyond that, because after all, Jim liked to hike cross country. Um, and he might have kept walking in the moonlight, thinking that he was going in the right direction. There was a full moon that night. Uh, you might want to search out six miles, in which case you'd have 70 square miles to search. That's two square miles larger than the District of Columbia, if you can imagine trying to search the entire District of Columbia. Uh, so that's a big area to search. There's only one known photo of the search itself. That's shown on the right. And you see how close together those guys are spaced and how difficult the terrain is. A body could be right next to those guys and they might not see them uh, because the undergrowth is so thick and you see it comes up to their waist. So my professional estimate is that only about 11 square miles uh, was searched. Uh, and I use uh, formulas from the National Association for Search and Rescue uh, and the standard uh, Search and Rescue Manual, which is available now. And, you know, Search and Rescue has come a long way since 1967, thank goodness. Uh, so I was able to use all these, uh, these formula and other information. So I think that's a uh, 11 square miles is a reasonable estimate, which would mean that they only delivered about 56% of the needed uh, search effort. Or if you think that they should have searched 70 square miles, that's only 15% um, of the uh, area to be searched. There was a fellow at the time who was quoted as saying, a search leader, that I need a regiment for a month to do this search. That would be 1,600 men times 31 days. That's 49,000 search days um, versus the only 1,400 that were delivered. So that would only be about 3% of the needed search effort was delivered. So maybe you can see where I'm going with all this. I'm starting to think that maybe the jungle was searched and he was not there, but maybe the jungle wasn't searched enough. Um, and I think that's a, a real possibility. That often happens, even today, many agencies, especially if they're not really experienced in search and rescue, underestimate how difficult it is. And in fact, the National Association of Search and Rescue has come up with a, what they call probability of detection. Uh, so this is a mathematical formula showing uh, what is the probability of detection under uh, search conditions? Now, let's say that I'm your, uh, I'm your search leader for a particular segment of the search area, and let's say that uh, you're, my, you're my boss. And I come to you and I say, well, boss, I searched that area, and we had a good team, and we paid attention, and we did a great job. So therefore, we can knock that off, and it's 100% searched, right? 
and you're smarter than me, and you say, uh, no, according to the National Association of Search and Rescue, your probability of detection is only 63%. Uh, why is that? Well, because people, uh, it's just, this is tough business. You're walking through the jungle, you're looking out for snakes and tigers and things like that. Um, you might miss a clue, it's hot, uh, you're miserable, um, you just look the wrong way and the clue is over here. Remember, you're looking for clues, not necessarily the body, because there may be hundreds of clues, but only one victim. So, uh, anybody see, um, uh, if you look there, for example, anybody see the cap in the uh, lower left? Yep. Wouldn't it be easy to walk past that? And, and that's a very vital clue. That's, uh, that's my baseball cap about six feet away right in that, uh, in that area. So quite easy to miss that. In order to get uh, even about 83% probability of detection, you have to search an entire area twice uh, in a very professional manner. And you can never get to 100%. So the other thing that uh, NASAR does is they say, well, to, if you want to get the probability of success for a search, you multiply the probability of detection times the probability of area. That's the probability that your guy is in um, the, uh, the particular search segment that you're looking at. And so, like a good economist, I came up with a, a high estimate and a low estimate. And so we come up with a probability of success of between 30 and 47 percent or lower. Uh, so again, this is pointing to the idea that uh, maybe the jungle was not searched sufficiently. And contributing to that conclusion are that there were many issues with the search. Remember, this was the biggest search in um, Malaysian history to, the, to that point. So all of these different agencies showed up, and they'd never really coordinated together. They were not really trained in search and rescue. Uh, they didn't even do some basic things, like they didn't block the trails. This is where you figure out how, what's the furthest that your victim can walk, and then you put teams at the end of the trails uh, blocking the area so that he or she can't get out of the area. Um, they only searched within 200 yards of the trails. What does that mean? It means they went down the main trail and they sent people off uh, looking 200 yards on either side of the trail. They came to a side trail, go up the side trail, send people off. Um, looking 200 yards on either side of the side trail. So that means that there are huge swaths of the jungle that they didn't search at all. Which, remember, this is a guy who likes to hike cross-country and enjoys that. So to me, that's, that's a blunder, I'm afraid. Biggest blunder of all, they brought in the most famous mystic in the world, <laughs> Peter Herkos, uh, to help with the investigation. And he actually influenced uh, General Black, who was uh, a U.S. Army general who was a friend of, of uh, Jim, who had flown down. He's shown in the lower right there. And he had flown down immediately upon hearing that Jim had uh, uh, disappeared and tried to help with the search. But uh, Herkos uh, sort of uh, walked around the, um, uh, the bungalow and concluded that Jim had been kidnapped and was now in Cambodia. Um, so they actually started pursuing that line. Now, in a modern investigation, you would never, ever allow a psychic, you know, inside the tent to uh, help with the investigation. You know, that's just a big no-no. Uh, there were 118 other psychics who showed up, um, many of whom uh, ran up and down the trails uh, firing off firecrackers to try to get rid of the evil spirits who had uh, kidnapped um, Jim. So uh, they were not very helpful. I think possibly there was a scenario lock. This is what ha often happens in an investigation. It's very difficult to keep your mind open and to think about all the possibilities. And I think maybe the Malaysian authorities got locked on the scenario, given you know as suggested by the dog evidence, that they um, uh, that he had been taken away and he was not nearby in the jungle. Uh, and even though to their credit they kept searching, uh, their heart might not have been in it. So with all the disparate searchers uh, and different organizations that showed up, some of whom not even speaking the same language, you have major problems. And this happens a lot in emergency management uh, and in um, search and rescue. And I wrote an article back in 1989 in the International Journal of Mass Emergencies on this, and I won't go into the mathematics, but basically with a few simple assumptions you can show mathematically that if you have a, a search size X and the next largest search is 10 times bigger, you would think that they would have 10 times as many problems in communication and management and so on. But actually, it goes up by 150 times. 
And I think that explains all the problems that we have in Hurricane Katrina and uh, similar uh, disasters around the world is you get so many outfits and different folks showing up who've never even communicated before that uh, you get a lot of problems. And that probably affected the quality of this search. The International Search and Rescue uh, Database has been created uh, since 1967 by this great gentleman here, Robert Kester. And the ladies in the audience will not be surprised to see that this chart here in the upper center shows that the typical person walking and stumbling around in the uh, wilderness out there alone and lost is male <laughs> by a huge margin. <laughs> Um, the chart in the upper right, uh, wh what uh, Kester did was he accumulated 16,000 cases of uh, search and rescue uh, victims, which is amazing, uh, and then categorized them in all kinds of ways. And he shows that uh, in only 3% of the male cases um, were uh, the disappearances leading to no trace found. So Jim Thompson's uh, very unusual in that regard. Uh, the next chart to the... Uh, down below on your right uh, in the middle there, um, shows that there's a 75% chance that even though Jim has been missing for all these years, it's quite possible, statistically speaking, that his body is within four miles of the, um, of the moonlight bungalow. And of course, you know, he may be in Cambodia or Tahiti or something like that, but this is just statistically speaking if he's in that area. Uh, and the uh, chart in the lower right shows that, statistically speaking, Jim could be either at higher, lower, or the same elevation. There's a myth that everybody walks downhill, uh, and in fact, that's not the case. It's about 50-50. And in the uh, left here, you see that it uh, might be a bit hard to read, so I'll tell you in, that the typical uh, search and rescue case last, or 99.7% of searches last less than three days. So the fact that this went on for 11 days is really spectacular. So Jim Thompson is a search suspect. He's quite unusual. He left behind his wallet, his money, his passport, his cigarettes, and he was a chain smoker. I mean, a real chain smoker. You know, he was, he was crazy. He was basically nuts. To, you know, he never saw, never seen a picture of him practically without a cigarette in his hand. Uh, left behind his driving license. You remember he was exhilarated to be lost the day before. He made six or seven blunders in the two or three days uh, before he departed um, that were kind of odd. He was really kind of in poor health. He had amoebic dysentery, and he also had um, uh, gastric uh, problems, uh, and um, gallbladder issues. So what was he? Maybe he was a little reckless, <clears throat> early dementia, or perhaps a risk taker. So what are some of the causes? Excuse me, I'm losing my voice here. Had a little bit of a cold. <laughs> So you see some of these causes. Um, maybe one is leopards, caves, boreholes. All of these can be reasonably eliminated. A tiger attack is possible, but there have been none since 1920. And tigers defend an area of 10 miles by 10 miles. So statistically, the chances are very low that you'd run into one of those. And there are various causes that uh, remain. Snake bite is possible, but statistically unlikely. And I've been through some of these others. Um, so I think that the probability, but not the certainty, is that there was an accident in the jungle and his body was missed in the search and rescue, or that he had a gallbladder attack or some other problem and then was exposed in the jungle and died and the search missed it. Let's look at his, uh, finishing with that case, let's look briefly at the murder case of his sister. This happened just a few months later in Pennsylvania. She was beaten to death. It was a very bloody crime. Uh, she was not molested. Nothing was stolen. Her two dogs did not um, assist her, apparently. And she lived alone, was discovered the next morning by the maid, and the case is still unsolved. 
One theory was that um, she had been killed by communist terrorists who had come over from um, Vietnam or that area to, and this was in the newspapers, to get, uh, to scare Jim, who was kidnapped back in Asia, and scare him by killing her and scare him into denouncing the war in Vietnam or something like that. Seemed credible at the time. To me, it sounds kind of uh, very unlikely, but who knows. Sadly, Catherine's uh, son is a suspect. He committed suicide about four years later. But there are other suspects, uh, including a maid, handyman, maybe even Jim Thompson. Um, after all, if you believe that he somehow self-disappeared, although there's no money trail, there's no paper evidence at all of that, if he self-disappeared, maybe uh, he hot-footed it over there, killed her. Uh, he did not get along with her. He, they, they had a lot of clashes. He, she did not approve of his lifestyle. So um, no evidence really anywhere. I got all of this from the Pennsylvania State Police uh, cold case officer uh, on the case, and he was very generous. He did not show me all the documents, but he did walk me through, uh, took about two hours and walked me through everything that was in there, so I am confident that I understand what he has and doesn't have. He was quite surprised when I uh, told him that the FBI had a had had a large file on this case as well as on the uh, associated Jim Thompson disappearance. And I said, is that in your file? And he said, nope, we don't have anything from the FBI. And in fact, I've received a letter from the FBI which says, uh, gives me some information, but it also says uh, documents that may pertain to your interests in these cases were destroyed in 1978, period. That's pretty strange um, and uh, pretty awful that the uh, FBI would destroy uh, information and not share it with the uh, jurisdiction having authority, which is the uh, Pennsylvania State Police. So that case was never solved. Another case which gives a little uh, insight, perhaps, is this wonderful guy, Forrest Gann. He's a biologist and mountaineer. He recently went missing in the Cameron Highlands in exactly the same area. He was looking for this, the largest flower in the world, um, which is named after Sir Stanford Raffles, and it smells like rotting meat. So uh, pretty, pretty weird uh, thing to look for. But he went off, He sort of like Jim, he made a lot of mistakes. He went off, he didn't tell anybody exactly where he was going, he didn't have a buddy, he didn't have survival equipment, uh, and he just disappeared. And the family actually contacted me, and um, I tried to help them with search strategy, but it's pretty clear now, it's been about 11 months that he's, uh, he's gone, and he's out there too. So, conclusions and implications. Well, since I worked for Booz Allen Hamilton for many years, I got to have a slide like this with the little Harvey balls, they're called, over on the right. Um, and this is the embarrassment level by, um, by scenario. So let's say that the case was reopened, I mean really reopened. And all of the files that CIA and the, the everyone had, um, FBI, everybody, were revealed tomorrow or the case was solved. If Jim Thompson disappeared, I think the Americans would be kind of... Um, embarrassed because we weren't able to track him down back in 1967. If the CIA file was open and ties revealed where he was uh, had a lot of contacts with the Thai government um, for many years, I think that would be a bit embarrassing. Um, and uh, if he was murdered by communists, uh, that would be embarrassing to the Chinese because they were pushing uh, the, those communist terrorists in that uh, period. If he was kidnapped by Malaysian gangs, I think the Malaysian government would be a bit embarrassed. And, of course, if he was murdered by Thai business rivals, especially if they were quite distinguished, uh, that would be uh, embarrassing to the Thai. So I think what everybody would like, except me, is this. So what are some next steps? Well, if I'm right, and I'm not saying I am right, I'm saying I think the probability is that his remains are still out in the jungle, but I'm not, uh, I'm not discounting completely any of those conspiracy theories. Uh, there would be a possible way, not a very likely way, but a possible way to solve this case, and that would be uh, to bring in some of the best people in the world. Best people in the world are a little outfit in San Diego called Metron. 
Um, they are the ones who found the Air France 447 uh, that went missing a few years ago in the South Atlantic. Uh, they work on search uh, all the time. They develop the Coast Guard software for search and rescue and so on. And they're the ones who develop these uh, maps, and I've worked with them on a number of occasions. Uh, what they do is they produce heat maps. And what you do is you come up with a scenario of where in, a, in an area uh, your guy might have gone, gone. And mainly you, you use it doing uh, topography. Uh, because most people, when they hit some sort of topographic feature, like a, uh, a power line or something, they'll turn and go along that. So you come up with scenarios, then you do Matson voting. That's where you, uh, the experts involved in the case um, vote, do secret ballot voting on it. And then that allocates your, um, uh, that leads to a mathematical development of your heat maps, which are the probability that uh, your guy or your plane is in that area. So on the right there is a case I'm working on off the, cal off the uh, Oregon coast, and the bright red areas or the orange areas are the ones where they're most probable uh, based on the flow of water and the tides and so on, even though the plane actually crashed uh, several miles north of all, all that, if, if it crashed there. Um, that's the heat map that Metron developed. So, and then once you uh, identify a number of distinct uh, likely areas, then you bring in the cadaver dogs. Uh, and they are fantastic. And then if they find some remains, then you do DNA testing. As you can see, each of those has a probability associated with it, and it's tough and moderately expensive, not ridiculously expensive, nothing like this uh, recent Malaysian case where, where they spent hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, you could do this all this for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, the cadaver dogs, by the way, that's a cadaver dog in the top center. Uh, amazingly, has anybody... Anybody familiar with cadaver dogs? Ever worked with them? They are absolutely staggering. That dog is looking for a body underwater that's been underwater for some time. Sounds impossible, right? But he's on the boat. What happens? It's kind of kind of gruesome, but a body underwater generates little bubbles, uh, scent. Those rise to the surface. The wind comes along, even a very gentle wind, and forms a V out from where they come up. You get the dog and the boat into that V. He alerts. And then you turn up toward the uh, top of the V. You get to the top of the V when he stops alerting. You figure out where that is. You send down the diver. And Bob's your uncle. You usually uh, got to find. It's quite amazing. On land, they're just as amazing. And they can find graves that are hundreds of years old. Uh, and they can distinguish between, let's say you've got three pieces of, uh, look like three toothpicks in front of you. And one is a toothpick. It's wood. He would not alert. The dog would not alert on that. Another is a little toothpick-sized piece of uh, deer bone. He would not alert on that. But the human bone, he could distinguish, uh, he or she could distinguish uh, uh, that and would alert on that. So it's, it's quite an amazing tool that's uh, used quite a bit these days. So as you can see, um, what I think is the, uh, the search was very impressive but not uh, big enough. Uh, I think there's some possibility of solving the case. I think it's possible that some of these uh, conspiracy theories are the answer, but I don't think it's likely. And um, another conclusion is that search and rescue is often not done very well. Uh, it wasn't done, I don't think, that well in this case in Malaysia. Uh, often it's problematic in less developed countries. I was worked for quite a while recently in Vanuatu, and uh, it was pretty disastrous there. But even in this country, uh, the Canadians do search and rescue much better than we do because they're centralized and they, they take it seriously. And we have jurisdictions that are very, very spotty. Some are great and some are awful. So if you uh, ever get lost yourself, be sure you do it in a jurisdiction that's well-funded and takes search and rescue seriously. So if you want to get my report, it's on www the Most Traveled, And I've also got some summary articles uh, I wrote for my newspaper that I write a column in. Uh, and you're welcome to see that. Uh, under New Land Adventures. Thank you very much, and good hunting. <clears throat> so, I'm sure no one has any questions, right? <laughs> Anybody? Oh, hold, please wait for the mic. Oh, hi. Um, just, if you could clarify, did you... You seem to be saying that no one exactly knew where he went hiking that day. No one 
saw where he went into the drum jungle. Is that right? That's right. He he did not tell anybody. He just said, "I'm going for an afternoon walk." He told his host that. They heard some crunching on the gravel. The gravel was near their window. They were taking a nap. Um, he, uh, Captain Mohammed, told me that they had found his chair where he sat on the veranda for a little while, apparently smoking a cigar. Um, and then after that, there was this crunching on the gravel. So that leads me to think that he probably went out the back, down the kitchen trail. Uh, but nobody knows. Nobody saw him for sure uh, after his host retired for this nap. Yeah, go ahead. When, so when you show the maps of the radius where they searched and so forth, did they base that on the assumption that he did take that kitchen trail, which might have been wrong? Uh, no. They, um, nobody ever mentioned the kitchen trail until I went up there and interviewed the house staff um, and, and Captain Mohammed. Now, he, he did know about it. So, yeah, you're right. He... That was a possibility they considered, but a lot of them thought he might have gone down the access road. Uh, there might have been another trail that went more to the southeast. They uh, searched possibility. all over. They searched all over. I mean, they, yeah, they, they tried to, uh, and they, you know, this hill is shaped sort of like this, so they actually had people going up and down the sides of the hill and at the bottom of the hill and, and that sort of thing looking. Um, so I hope that they uh, did a credible job. They, they certainly uh, feel that they did. Unfortunately, there's no annotated notes or detailed um, you know, uh, maps or anything like that. Yes, sir. Um, on the day before, um, he, did he bring his cigarette with him the day before when he, was, um, he couldn't find his way back? Right. Good question. I don't know. Um, I've never read anything about that, and I think I would remember. Um, that day was not really analyzed in the kind of depth that the Sunday was. So um, I'm not sure on that. Interesting question. I've never been asked that before, but thank you. Don't know. Yes, ma'am. I've read a number of books on this case, um, and I've always thought that the, the idea that he might have self-disappeared himself is, is always kind of glossed over. But as a trained intelligence officer, he would know very well how to put a scenario like that together. He had been to the Moonlight Cottage previously, mm -hmm. so he would know the terrain. He could have even made some arrangements. He could have put a bicycle here. He could have, he could have done whatever he needed to do. But basically, I mean, today we would call it going off the grid. If Jim Thompson wanted to just disappear without a trace, he would have left his cigarettes. He would have mm -hmm. left his meds his passport, because he had more cigarettes, more meds, more passports, and he would have just evaporated. It's how um, a lot of intelligence agencies will, will do an exfiltration. People just are gone, and no one knows where they went. So do you ever go back and examine that possibility that he wanted to not be found, that he wanted to disappear? He's depressed. He's not well. Mm -hmm. uh, there had to be motivation, and that would be a, a separate conversation. But do you totally rule it out? No. Um, I think that's one of the ones that's possible, but I would say unlikely. Now, why do I say that? Uh, I agree with you that he was trained and smart. Um, I don't think he had the access to all of the goodies uh, at the time that he would have had some years before, like, you know, just snap your fingers and get a passport. It's pretty clear that he was not in the inner circle anymore uh, with CIA. Uh, but even if you say that he was, let's, let's, uh, let's say he was. Um, I can't think of a less likely place to disappear from uh, and more difficult than Tanarata. There's only two roads in. Uh, there's that little downtown that everybody notices everything that goes on. Uh, there's one road that goes uh, to the north and one road back toward the coast um, where you might easily be spotted. I mean, he would have to do all of these um, arrangements, um, and it would just be so much easier to disappear from, say, Singapore, where, you know, one of the hubs of the world, where he was going to be the next day. Um, so why not pick there? Or Bangkok, where he had all these friends and assets, and, um, and he was uh, also in Kuala Lumpur at one point. So another reason was that it's been reported by a number of sources. Uh, you know, I wasn't there, but uh, some people 
dispute this, but uh, reliable sources say that he made a number of blunders before he went up there. He almost didn't leave Bangkok at all because he hadn't filed the proper paperwork uh, with the revenue authority, which sort of uh, didn't allow you to go unless you paid all your taxes or something. And Connie Mungskow, the one of his best friends, um, had to make that happen at the airport. She had to kind of fix it up. Um, so this, this doesn't seem to me to be like a guy who's got everything all planned and so forth. So I would say possible, but I'd put it as much less likely than, than the KISS solution. You know, the KISS is keep it simple, stupid. And that's what Metron uses all the time. And, and they say, uh, you know, look, here's a guy, I mean, they would say, I think, if they were standing here, um, they're some of the best in the world. But here's a guy who went into the most, one of the most dangerous environments uh, on earth. He made every mistake in the book, and he paid for it. Now, I'm not saying that's absolutely for sure, but I think it's probable. Okay. Um, in case you're wondering who that woman with the beautiful voice and all the knowledge was, that's John Mendez, one of our board members ah, and a yeah. former chief of disguise all right. at the CIA. Well, well, then let me give you the floor, and what do you think of my answer? I think your answer is a, is a good answer, but I think, I think you, can keep, you can keep peeling back this onion and, and the fact that it was an unlikely spot would make it perhaps a likely spot. It would it would look impossible. It it could be possible. I have no idea what happened to Jim Thompson, but I'm terribly interested in the subject, and I loved your presentation. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's awfully nice. Um, yes, uh, almost every item. Almost every argument can be turned around in this case, and that's one of the things that makes it so fascinating and difficult. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm just sort of curious when we, you went through and said he had made a lot of enemies, uh, particularly in the art wheel art world, um, knowing that you know he left this legacy. The irony is that it's it's thriving and flourishing to this day, uh, 50 years later. Mm -hmm. And I, I just wondered if any had thought had been given that he may have been brokering an art deal. Um, <laughs> Out of out of reach of authorities, hmm. right? Uh, and then may have wanted it back, um, hmm. or something like that. I've um, you know, a honeypot, but you know, I'm kind of a messenger. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I have uh, various sources, but they're all in the report, and and plus I've got the various books and articles and so on. I've never actually heard that one um, brought up. There's there's no evidence that I've ever come across on that one, but again, I'd say possible, but I like to see, you know, at least a press report, which, you know, I don't even believe half of what I believe, <laughs> read in the press, but at least something, uh, and I've never seen anything along those lines, um, except for the, the fact that I mentioned that there was this dispute with the Thai Fine Arts Department, uh, which had been several years before, but it's still clearly uh, rankered with him, and he, he would often mutter to his friends, apparently, well, uh, you know, Thailand isn't like it used to be. Uh, I'm going to get out of here. Uh, you know, the, these guys gave me the order of the white. It, sorry? Right. It, it was, uh, yeah, and he, he was, uh, he, you know, just before these Thai heads were seized, he had been given the order of the white elephant um, uh, by the government. So he was, you know, it, sort of slapped back and forth. I mean, he was told he was the greatest, and then suddenly his name is blackened, and he was really quite upset, I think, for the rest of his life uh, with the government. Yes, ma'am. Assuming that uh, he didn't fall ill in the jungle and that he wanted to, you know, be found, after nightfall, would he have been able to see the lights of the moonlit cottage or other parts of the town? It depends. Uh, there was a, a full moon, which might have encouraged him to keep walking. A lot of victims in search and rescue keep walking uh, when they probably should stay put, uh, even especially if there is some overhead light. To your uh, question on the lights of the town, uh, it depends. If he went up, uh, you know, my one little pet theory I've got is I, I was there and I looked around and I said, well, if I had a couple hours to kill, what would I do? I would go down the kitchen trail and I'd go up this drainage and then there's two, a two-headed peak that's not, not a real mountain but just sort of a hill there uh, that has a graveyard, an orang asli 
graveyard, that's the local um, uh, Aborigines. Uh, that, you know, that all sounds pretty cool to me. That's what I would do. If he was up there, then he could see the lights of the town, and he could perhaps look back and see the moonlight bungalow. Uh, if he went beyond that and started heading for that, uh, that continental divide that I was talking about, then absolutely not. And in fact, most of the hills there are so sort of steep and conical that um, it's, it's tough to see um, line of sight to the town. And remember, the town was very small at the time and not much, not like a city or anything. Okay. Uh, yes. This, yeah, okay. Hi. Um, so first of all, thank you. Uh, really interesting. And as a former ISB student as well, I appreciate right. that little link. Um, <laughs> so one thing that I think is really interesting about this is how um, when you're there and you're at the house, you don't really get into the disappearance as like what happened and kind of this mystery. And so right. I was kind of wondering more um, what your thoughts are, your senses from how the Thai people are viewing this, if you have any sense of that. Well, I've been, you know, recently to the house and, of course, took the tour, and not a mention was made of the disappearance. And I had to bring it up at the end, and I said, didn't, didn't this guy disappear? And this was after I'd written, <laughs> written my report, so I knew the answer. Uh, and they said, oh, yes, he disappeared, period. So, uh, you know, I think it's, it's been 50 years. Uh, I tried, I mean, one of the reasons I did this report was because I was afraid that on the 50th anniversary, which is right now, there would be the usual spate of press accounts in the Thai newspapers and, you know, the Bangkok world and stuff, uh, which are usually not the greatest journalism in the world. They're sort of like, oh, yeah, I went down there and I tried to interview this taxi driver who went searching for Jim Thompson and got lost and is now, his nickname is Jim Thompson. Um, and, uh, but the guy, the guy's so irritated by being called Jim Thompson that he refuses to be interviewed anymore. So that people chase him around and that's, that's the kind of stuff that comes up. No, no scientific evaluation, nothing like that. So I was trying to elevate the level of discussion, uh, a little bit, but I did get one, uh, I think Deutsche Presse, uh, agency, uh, has correspondence in, in Thailand and they did asked me some questions, and, and there is an article on the internet you can find now uh, that they wrote. But that's, I think, the only one. So uh, I don't know how the Thai people think. I think, you know, this is kind of ancient history. Uh, I'm getting older. It doesn't seem like ancient history to me, but uh, I find it fascinating. But um, I, I don't think it's making a big impact. Yes, ma'am, I think she was next uh, right there. Yeah. Yeah. It has been a wonderful presentation. My question is not about the search per se, uh, but just curiosity. What You've mentioned William Warren a couple of times. Was the relationship just friendship between those two men? Is, that, is there anything other than that? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, you know, he wrote an excellent book, and of the four books that have been written, I'd say his is the best. And by the way, he acknowledges in there, if you read it carefully, that the search might not have been nearly as extensive enough as it, uh, as it should have been. Uh, and then it was a very, very difficult search area. As to their relationship, I know they were friends, um, colleagues, uh, both uh, keen on art. I don't know if there was anything uh, beyond that. Um, he's still alive, and he actually answered a few questions by email to me, and I was very grateful for that. Um, but I'm, I really don't know the answer. Uh, do you know the answer? And is there, you know, there, there may be folks here who know about this case, uh, and if anybody can shake loose that CIA file, I mean, this is the audience to do it, so get cracking. <laughs> yes, ma'am. That was my other question. How forthcoming was the CIA, if you, I assume you went in with freedom of information or... Right. What kind of volume? I mean, did they release documents? Did they give you anything that was useful? Well, yes and no. So they gave me a lot of documents, but they were all from the good old OSS days. Uh, and, and so I actually have his war record. Uh, and in my report, you're welcome to look at it. You can see some of his fitness reports, how he was trained, um, how generally he got good fitness reports. But one person said, um, this officer doesn't care about anybody except himself or something nasty like that. Um, but you can see lots of stuff. So there's maybe 30 or 40 pages, uh, which I was surprised to get. But then it all cuts off at uh, 46. Um, and I was not able to get anything past his resignation from OSS. Except um, two years after I filed my Freedom of Information Act, just a few weeks ago, I got something from CIA that which they released, which 
said in response to a, I think it was a congressional inquiry some years ago, um, uh, they, the agency said, this person, Jim Thompson, at the time of his disappearance had no relation to the agency uh, and was not connected in any way to the agency. So they were kind enough to release that. Now, some people may believe that, some people may not. I don't. Well, in today's world where there are facts and, and there are other facts, right. you, you, <laughs> sort of, you sort of have to weigh every word. Exactly. Because there are all kinds of relationships in the intelligence community that are not relationships on purpose. Right. They are not relationships, right. uh, but still. Yep. I worked in Bangkok years ago. I worked ah. um, for the CIA, and um, there were still lots of questions floating around about Jim Thompson sure. back then. So it's part of why I'm what, so interested. What was, the, what was the prevailing theory at the time there in was the cocktail never, circuit? There was never that kind of conversation that I was exposed to. Okay. But there was a file. Right. There is a file. And, right. and um, the one that I saw was enormous. Right. I just wonder if somebody goes after it, um, right. if anything comes out of it. Well, I did ask for everything, you know, everything connected with uh, James Thompson. And, um, and before me, the chap uh, who wrote that other book, uh, Joshua Kurlancic, he, he asked for that file. And I think he got exactly what I got. But he also did develop some sources, including a former station chief uh, there, Mr. Jansen, I think it was the name. Yeah, OK. Um, and he uh, and Jansen's wife, after Jansen uh, deceased in, in Hawaii. So he has a few footnotes in his book that cite um, these sources where he'll just say unnamed CIA source or something. So he actually developed a bit more than I did, and I piggybacked on him. But basically what he's, he, his theory seems to be that um, uh, maybe Jim was so passionately opposed to the, um, or one of his many theories, he was so opposed to the Vietnam War that uh, he was quieted uh, because of that, or kidnapped and quieted. Seems pretty unlikely to me, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, yes, ma'am, over here. I, I understand there are a lot of hill tribes in Thailand. Were any of them around that area? Were any of them contacted? Were they involved in any of the searches? Right. So the hill tribes in northern Thailand um, were not involved because the uh, disappearance uh, was in uh, northern Malaysia. But there are Orang Asli there. It, not exactly hill tribes, but they're, um, it's the name Orang means people and Asli the sort of native people. So these are folks who are not Malay and they're sort of smaller and uh, wonderful folks, uh, very peaceful. Um, they were questioned extensively by this guy, uh, Noon, who was brought in as an expert who had known them quite a bit. And it seems, even though he wasn't there very long, um, I think he probably would have gotten some indication that they were involved. There, is, there are some people who say, well, maybe the Orang Asli dug a, a pit trap, and he fell into the pit trap, and uh, therefore uh, died, and... Uh, that and then Arang Asli came along and said, "Oh my God, we've killed this guy, and we got to bury him somewhere else, or something like that." So I looked into that a bit. Um, my guides, several guides there, um, I didn't have time, and I, this is my only regret, to go and really interview the Arang Asli myself. Uh, if anybody wants to do that, please do that, and you can add uh, to the report. Um, but I interviewed a number of people who know them very well, and they say they don't drink, dig really huge pits. Uh, because it, the earth there is awful. Uh, the earth is like red Georgia clay, very difficult to dig in. And so they might dig some little small things to catch, you know, a raccoon or, or the local equivalent, but they're not going to dig something big enough to catch a pig, much less a person. Um, they, they use other means. So that, uh, and other people have interviewed the Orang Asli over time, and they seem like the sort of innocent enough and nice enough folks that at some point they would have said they would have been a deathbed confession or something like that. And nothing like that has ever come to light. Yep. Nope. Nope. Um, yep. Just real quick, uh, did you talk to Connie Mankskow's uh, daughter? I've spoken to her granddaughter. Okay. Um, and she's been very helpful. And we were scheduled to do a joint presentation uh, at the ISB reunion 
um, some time ago, the International School of Bangkok Reunion. But then she, at the last minute, she couldn't make it. Uh, but she was helpful, and she shared some of uh, her memories uh, with me. She's, uh, she's quite different from me. She very much believes in a conspiracy uh, theory, and I respect that. Uh, she thinks that somebody did him in, and like I say, that's possible. I think there was a question over yep. Maybe there. Maybe we'll call this the last question. Okay. And I can um, hang around afterwards if you like. Okay. Um, the, the U.S. Army got involved in the search, and uh, several uh, intelligence agencies were obviously very interested in it. And uh, would you consider that normal for somebody who was by then a private American citizen living in Thailand? Or right. does that indicate that there was something more going on? Good question. Um, so read the U.S. Army. Um, uh, I think it's unusual that a U.S. general would rush down, and he was criticized, uh, General Black, for leaving his command in northern Thailand and rushing down there. Um, he was a friend, a very close friend. He had introduced um, the wife, uh, Jim, to Jim uh, at the beginning of the war. The army was also, in the he brought along several aides, uh, two aides. Um, there's a lot of, there are reports in the press that the U.S. Army supplied helicopters that aided in the search. Uh, I'm pretty convinced that that's not the case and that it was a press error because uh, when I interviewed Lieutenant uh, Horgan, who was later the editor of the Bangkok World, he told me that he's heard that and no, there were no U.S. helicopters brought down, which, you know, would be a flight of hundreds and hundreds of miles and, you know, helicopters don't have a huge range. There were several Malaysian helicopters that were used, um, but they... Uh, within a few hours, they concluded that the jungle canopy and the, and the growth on the ground was so thick that they were pretty useless, so they gave up after a while. So the U.S. Army's involvement was pretty small, uh, but there were cables flying everywhere and, you know, reports to the director of the FBI and, uh, you know, this is pretty unusual stuff. So to you, the second part of your question, I think it is very unusual. Um, I think he was a very, very famous person. I mean, here's a guy who pretty much knows everybody who's anybody in Washington uh, who would come through, you know, Kennedys and Johnsons and, and all those kind of guys. So um, it's not necessarily proof that he was still in the inner circle of CIA that there was so much hoopla. Uh, I, th I think the fact that he had clearly been in that circle and was famous could be an explanation, but it may be a bit of evidence, a uh, straw in the wind, pointing toward a conspiracy. Lou, I'm wrong. We have one more question. All right. Well, actually, it's not quite a question. We happen to be from Thailand. Right. We are Thai. Swadika. Swadika. <laughs> and uh, I happened to be old enough to have met Jim Thompson. All right. Yes. I was wa working in the Bangkok world, uh, and uh, he was very close friend of my editor, uh, Daryl Berrigan, who died, who was killed uh, in actually, I said 1963. It's not. It's 1965. Mm -hmm. It's quite close to the days when uh, uh, Jim Thompson disappeared. I met him a few times. I didn't know him very well, but we were kind of. I was a young reporter at the time, and uh, <clears throat> the conspiracy. There was a conspiracy theory in Thailand at that point among us uh, journalists, uh, that there was a connection between the death of Daryl Berrigan in 1965 and Jim Thompson's disappearance, because both were friends in the OSS days. Mm -hmm. They were very close. Uh, Jim visited our, uh, our newspaper, what, what you call our office, mm -hmm. very often, and uh, so uh, you were s talking about, you, somebody was saying, you know, what did the Thais think about it at the time? Mm -hmm. A lot of us think that it was conspiracy, it was uh, something <laughs> to do with, uh, with the American intelligence. I'm not, uh, that, that was, again, you know, is, is in the air. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, regarding your possibility about the Director General of the Fine Arts Department uh, 
conflict with him, I can I think you can write that completely out because mm -hmm. Thai civil servant uh, serving you know a period of time as director general or whatever would not be passionate enough to kill somebody. <laughs> <laughs> I'm relieved to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can vouch for that. Uh, and um, now there was something else I was going to say. I forgot. Um, sorry, I, I, it went off. I'm quite old, you know, having known <laughs> no. Jim Thompson. <laughs> you don't sound <laughs> it to me. <laughs> Good. So well, thank you for that, that comment. Okay, That's very, uh, very interesting. Thank you, right. thank Lou you very much. Tolman, very much. And thanks to everyone for coming in your great questions. All right. All right.